Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our study here this morning. Now, normally, Dwight presents these studies. He's done 84 of them, dealing with uh, the minor prophets and last day events. Uh, but he doesn't have a voice this morning, so I'm going to be filling in. I don't know if he's going to come to the study or not, but uh, um, we're going to cover uh, material that he covered at the beginning. It's sort of a, a summary of what this study has been about. And we're going to look at this main uh, statement in the spirit of prophecy that he used um, as the premise for this study of looking at the minor prophets. But before we begin, uh, can you all join me in a word of prayer? A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, uh, the precious hours in which we can commune with you, and we receive uh, a special blessing. We're thankful for the fellowship that we can have, uh, that we have each day with you, and with one another in the various studies. And we invite, Lord, your presence here into this study, into our hearts, into our minds. We know we are living in solemn times. There's much happening around us that is fulfillments of prophecy, and many seem unaware. But mostly, Lord, we are unaware of the battle going on in our own hearts and how the enemy, in many cases, is winning. Um, we know, Lord, when we look at our own hearts, we can see uh, the sin that lies deep within, that's been hidden, that we seek to hide. We ask, Lord, that your light can enter into our heart and reveal to us our need of you, that those sins can be removed, and that this work of, of purifying your church uh, can be completed, that Christ can return. We pray for each person searching for these truths. We ask, Lord, that they can have the same purpose uh, to seek to have sin removed in their lives. We pray, Lord, that you can be with each person now as we open your word together. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So good morning again, and happy Sabbath. So uh, some of you have come, come on. Obviously, I'm presenting. Dwight's not presenting. He doesn't have a voice this morning. And uh, so we're going to look at uh, this is the initial passage in the spirit of prophecy. That was the whole premise for this study. So Dwight had been doing a study on these books. Malachi, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and some of the other minor prophets. And um, here this statement in the spirit of prophecy says, In the night season, I was in my dreams in a large meeting with ministers, their wives, and their children. And I wondered that the company present was mostly made up of ministers and their families. The prophecy of Malachi was brought before them in connection with Daniel, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah. The teaching of these books was carefully investigated. The building of the temple, the temple service, were considered. There was close searching of the scriptures in regard to the sacred character of all that appertained to the temple service. Through the prophets, God is given a delineation of what will come to pass in the last days of this earth's history. And the Jewish economy is full of instruction for us. Now, you know, in the past, if we would have read this spirit of prophecy statement, uh, at least I know if I would have read this, let's say, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, I would not have noticed much that is in this statement. I might have noticed some of these things and, and understood what they meant. But there's a lot here that we wouldn't generally recognize as, as a Seventh-day Adventist. For instance, when it says God is given a delineation of what will come to pass in the, in the last days, 
we just sort of think, well, God's going to lay out for us what's going to happen. But we understand that delineation means to set upon a line. And that this is a method of study that's um, uh, urged upon us in Isaiah 28, that we are to do things or set, to set in order upon a line the events of sacred history. And, and this is what this movement has done. So when we think of, when we see delineation, we understand that that's a line. And this is a delineation of what will come to pass in the last days of this earth's history. And it's the Jewish economy that is full of instruction for us. Now, when we think about the Jewish economy, um, you know, generally we think about the sacrifices and the offerings. That's what Ellen White is referring to. But if we take these and consider, uh, especially Haggai and Zechariah, and we're looking at the prophecy of Malachi and Daniel, um, and we're going to look at, at what she's talking about here. But Haggai and Zechariah, what is it that they're writing about? What is when are they writing? And what is the topic of this of their their prophecies of their book, their books? Why is she talking here about Haggai and Zechariah? Anybody know what the primary topic is of these? Okay, so Iran has said in the comments there, good chat. Uh, the building of the temple. So both Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries, and they're going to be writing in uh, basically that period uh, from 520 uh, to 518 B.C., starting in the second year of um, Darius. So that's Darius who's going to give his decree. Uh, his decree is going to happen uh, more than 20 years after Cyrus's decree. So just a little over 20 years after Cyrus's decree. Not much over, just a little over, 20 years in a few months. And... Um, so Haggai and Zechariah are writing in that period of time prior to uh, Darius's decree. So they're prophesying regarding the rebuilding of the sanctuary. Now, those two books were really instrumental in understanding uh, the prophecy of Leviticus 26. So understand, studying Haggai and Zechariah was uh, part of what I studied was the chronology of those books. Um, now, of course, we know that what Daniel addresses and the book of Zephaniah. Does anybody know what that book is primarily about? It's not one book that I've studied a great deal in the past at all. Um, Does anybody know when that book was written? Obviously, it's it's one of the later minor prophets. Is it not uh, 630, 629? Okay. Still? Yeah, so it's writing, and I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, yeah, it's around that time I'm trying to remember um, so this is going to be in the days of Josiah, right? So I'm just trying to think about where in the days of Josiah. So, um, so Josiah uh, is um, executing these reforms. So he's going to die in uh, 609. So I'm not sure exactly how soon before this that uh, Zephaniah writes 
I don't think it, it gives us enough information. But we know uh, that it's going to be written in the time of Josiah. So Josiah's ministry, he, he um, or his ministry, his, his reign is from about 630, 29 to, to uh, let me think here. Just, so it'd about be about 640 BC to 609, 31 years. So anyway, it's, it's in that period of time that this is going to be written, the book of Zephaniah. So it's in the time of Josiah. Um, so, so we have these, these books written, uh, the one book, Zephaniah, written before uh, Daniel's captivity, because Daniel's going to be taken captive in 609, and uh, two books that are written after the time of Daniel, and then the book of Daniel itself, Plus, this is to be studied in connection with the prophecy of Malachi. So if we, we say what the prophecy of Malachi, what prophecy would she be referring to? So I'm going to go here to Malachi. Now Malachi, of course, is the last book, right? The last book of the Old Testament. So is she just talking about the entire book of Malachi when she says the prophecy of Malachi? So what would she be referring to as the prophecy of Malachi? Would it be Malachi chapter 3? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Um, would it be this passage, or would it be the whole book of Malachi, or would we even just say it's, it's going to be um, Malachi 4 verse 4? Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel and with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So here we have um, chapter four. So. We could just say this is all part of the same prophecy. We could just take the whole book. But Ellen, when Ellen White is saying that we should study the book of Malachi in connection with Zephaniah, Daniel, Haggai, and Zechariah, um, what would be the prophecy of Malachi? What is it that we should be looking at? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to come back to that question. And we're going to read more of this statement in the spirit of prophecy. So we had read the one paragraph. Now, this um, is uh, um, Review and Herald, February 4th, 1902. All right, so that's the, the statement that we read. And... Um, so the prophecy of Malachi was brought before them in connection with Daniel, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah. Now, this is the ministers and their families that are gathered together in this company. That's what Ellen White sees in vision. We're in a dream. And then she says the teachings of these books, well, the teaching of these books was carefully investigated. And this was in connection with the building of the temple. The temple service were considered. And there was a close searching of the scriptures in regard to the sacred character of all that appertained to the temple service. So you're going to look at the temple, the building of the temple, the service of the temple, and then the character, the sacred characters that's needed. That's um, in order to to be involved in this temple service. Then she says, through the prophets, God has given a delineation. He's set upon a line these events 
So what we can say is that whatever she's talking about here, it has to do with last day events. It has to do with line upon line. And it has to do with the type of character, the sacred character that we need, and an understanding of the temple itself and, and the rebuilding of the temple. Now she goes on to say, the offering of beasts did not cleanse away sin, but was a symbol of the great and complete sacrifice that was to be made for the sins of the whole world. The rivers of blood that flowed at the harvest thanksgiving when sacrifices were offered in such large numbers were meant to teach a great truth. For even the productions of the earth, the bounties provided for man's sustenance, we are indebted to the offering of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. God teaches us that, that all we receive from him is the gift of redeeming love. From his instruction to Israel, he would have us learn that he has made ample provision for the poor to receive the comforts of this life and also for the gospel to be carried to all those who are perishing in their sins. So we see here that the offerings of the sacrifices is teaching, it's meant to teach a great truth, our indebtedness to God and our responsibility in sharing the gospel and that God has given us these blessings, these provisions uh, to give the gospel. Right. And, and God has given us ample provisions for the poor and also for the gospel to be carried to all those who are perishing in their sins. So, so all of these lessons are being taught um, then she says the whole sanctuary service was designed to impress the people with the fact that the things which God has set apart for himself are holy. They were ever to be ever to observe the distinction between the sacred and the common holy things must be kept holy. Now she's actually writing this um, in connection with the tithe. So, if we go back here a little bit earlier, she says the tithe is God's portion, not all the property, not at all the property of man. And the scripture declares that he who withholds it is guilty of robbery. Who then will stand with clean hands before the Lord? Um, so one of the things we know about Malachi is it talks about the tithe. It talks about the offerings. Right. So, I mean, if I read this whole uh, section here it's going to go through the first part is going to address uh, this idea of the offerings and and the tithe right so so when she's talking about the distinction between the sacred and the common um, this has a wide variety of applications but one is it does re re relate to the tithe and the offerings the things that are dedicated to god the sanctuary service but we live in this world as well. There are things that are common. And we need to make a distinction between that. We can't mix the common with the sacred. One of the things that we see presently in, in the world and in the church is that the common has come into uh, the church. The type of music that's listened to, the type of conversations that are engaged in, even the topics of sermons uh, would be considered uh, common. That is, we see strange fire. Um, holy things must be kept holy. And people uh, trample upon holy things all the time in our society. Uh, holy things are not considered sacred. <clears throat> she then goes on, all these things were closely studied by the company before me in my dream scripture was compared with scripture and application was made of the word of god to our own time so of course this is uh something that we've been doing in the morning studies not not studying these prophecies but studying uh, the book of judges and we're making application to our own time 
Now, generally what you see in the Christian world, and even within Adventism today, that if we're studying something from the Bible, a story from the Bible, all we're looking for is the moral lesson. We're not making an application of that story prophetically. We're not seeing a delineation of events. We're not setting them upon a line and comparing the events of the past prophetically with the events of the present. We're generally not doing that. It's rare to see that happen. But in this movement, that is the basic premise that this movement was built upon, that we could take Millerite history and we would repeat that history. And that the history of all prophecies, that all things written in the scriptures were written for our learning, not just for moral learning, but they're written as in samples or types of what is happening presently. And so we've seen that. We could take the book of Judges, and that doesn't mean it's the only application. But we could take the book of Judges, and we could see that it gives us the history from 9-11 to 2023. And that we could make an application of what has happened in our movement, the history of our movement. Now, we can look at uh, the book of Malachi. We can look at the book of Daniel. We can look at the rebuilding of the temple. And we can see that those events that happened in the past relate directly to the events of the present. And that we can set those upon a line and the chronological symbols that exist in those stories can be applied to the present. <clears throat> so scripture was compared with scripture and application was made of the word of God to our own time. So this is what she sees in this dream at this meeting of these ministers and their families studying the book of Malachi and Daniel and Haggai and Zechariah and Zephaniah. She says, after a diligent searching of the scriptures, there was a period of silence. A very solemn impression was made upon the people. The deep moving of the spirit of God was manifest among us. All were troubled. All seemed to be convicted, burdened, and distressed as they saw their own life and character represented in the word of God. And the Holy Spirit was making the application to their hearts. So we can see what she's saying here is in this dream, she sees this company made up mostly of ministers and their families studying the book of Malachi in connection with Zephaniah, Daniel, Zechari Haggai, and Zechariah. And as they studied these things in connection with the sanctuary service, they saw the type of character that we needed to accomplish the task that God has given us to, to help the poor and to give the gospel to the world, to those that are perishing in their sins. And this study brought upon them a conviction, a very solemn impression. And what did they see? Did they see the sins of others, the sins of the world? Is that what they saw? Did they see all of the faults of others? Did they see, you know, how the church is bad? Did they see the sins of their brothers and sisters? What did they see? They were troubled. They were convicted, burdened, and distressed, not by what they saw out there in the world, by what they saw in their own life and character, because they saw this represented in the word of God. And the Holy Spirit, whose work is to bring, convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, was making the application to their hearts. So when we take the scriptures and we look at the past and we make an application to the present, the reason is for us to see our own defects of character. She then goes on to say, conscience was aroused. The record of past days was making its disclosure of the vanity of human inventions. Not so much machinery, but the ideas that man has. <clears throat> 
and and it's making its di disclosure that is it's opening up making us something uh seen that was hidden so the record of past days can help us to see something that was hidden and that, that is the vanity the emptiness of human inventions ideas the Holy Spirit brought all things to their remembrance. As they reviewed their past history, there were revealed defects of character that ought to have been discerned and corrected. They saw how, through the grace of Christ, the character should have been transformed. The workers had known the sorrow of defeat in the work entrusted to their hands when they should have had victory. Now we can all see that we have had, we've experienced the sorrow of defeat in our own personal lives. We've sometimes been pretty disgusted with ourselves in, in our Christian experience. But we've tried to hide those things, to bury them. But as we look at the prophecies of Scripture, as we see God's purpose and plan, as these things are delineated, the events of the past, we are to see in those events in scripture, in sacred history, something that will make us aware of our own defects of character. She goes on, she says, the Holy Spirit presented before them him whom they had offended. So, in this study of these Old Testament prophecies, the books of Daniel, Malachi, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah, in connection with the sanctuary truths, what did they see? The Holy Spirit presented what to them? What did they see? They saw Christ. Now, often you hear in the, in the churches, the popular churches, in Adventism, that we need to behold Jesus Christ. But how do we behold him, and how do we know we're beholding Christ? Mostly what they want us to do is just imagine what Christ is like. They want us to use our imagination. But to know what Christ is like, to have Christ presented before you, First, the Holy Spirit has to do that. That is, we can't just imagine what, what Christ is like. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does it through a study of the inspired books, those books of Scripture that were inspired by the Holy Spirit in the first place. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That is, you can't interpret the holy scriptures. That is, they're not private interpretation. That is, you can't, you can't just interpret them with your mind. Because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that inspired the scriptures is to reveal them the teachings of the scriptures, the understanding of the scriptures to your mind. And we have to study the scriptures, but we need the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit studying the books inspired by that spirit, Christ will be revealed before us. Him whom they had offended. So when we see Christ, the other thing we see here in this statement is a revelation of Jesus Christ will always bring before us a sense of the fact that we have offended him. His character in contrast to ours. The popular mind, the popular sentiment regarding Christ is that they make him extremely human, very common. Somebody that, you know, we can identify with in the sense that he, he doesn't seem very different from us. And 
And there's some truth in that because Christ came and took upon himself our nature. He identified with us. But this is the holy God coming to identify with us. But what we do is we can bring him down onto our level, which is different than him coming down to our level. You understand what I'm saying there? Christ condescended to save humanity. But he is still God. His character, the standard that he presents, is higher than any human thought can reach. It is divine. And we have very little appreciation of the divine. We have very little appreciation. Because we have very little appreciation of the divine, we have very little appreciation of our distance from God, of how sinful we are. And we can imagine, just because we compare ourselves with humanity, that we're better than so-and-so, that we haven't done such-and-such. Such. I'm thankful that I'm not like other men are, that I, I, I pay my tithes of all that I possess. I, possess uh, I, I fast twice in the week. And I'm not like this publican. That's the Pharisee. But we are like that. We don't see how unchristlike we are. And this message, this movement was designed by God for us to see, to examine the scriptures and apply it to our own lives and to see that we are indeed far from God. And we talk about this um, um, Mare vision. I can't remember if it's the Mare or Mara. It's the one that's the looking glass vision, this vision, this revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we could talk of it in this movement. But when somebody would offend us, somebody would cut us off. Somebody would um, be doing something that we wanted to do or presenting some truth or getting attention. Jealousy and envy and hatred and bitterness. The study that we had last night from A.T. Jones, all of those characters would be manifest, showing us that we're in Babylon, that we haven't come out of Babylon, and we can't give a message to come out of Babylon. So the Holy Spirit pre pre presented before this group of people who were studying the scriptures in this way, they presented before them, the Holy Spirit presented before them, Christ, the one whom they had offended, and they saw that God will not only reveal himself as a God of mercy and forgiveness and long forbearance, right? So this is what people focus upon. God is merciful. He's forgiving. He's patient. He will, for, he will you know, bear long with you with your sins. And, and that's the type of God people want to hear about, right? Because they still want to continue in their sins, But Ellen White says they saw God will not only reveal himself as this type of God, this merciful, forgiving God, but terrible. But by terrible things in righteousness, he will make it manifest that he is not a man that he should lie. God's righteousness, his terrible things in righteousness, his judgments upon sin. God is not a man that he should lie. He's going to reveal his righteousness. And in doing so, sin will be condemned. Sinners will be condemned. God has to do this work. He can't allow sin to continue forever. He has to cut it short in righteousness. She then goes on to say, words were spoken by one saying the hidden 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 inner life will be revealed as if reflected in a mirror so that's the looking glass vision right we have the chazon you know the the panoramic vision the mar mara or mare so be mare mare right you're going to have that what they call the snapshot vision jeff called it and then we have the Marah, right? We have this 
uh, looking glass vision. It's the feminine form of Marais. Um, so this is the mirror. When we see our characters in a mirror, we have two options. We can just walk away, forget what manner of man we are, or we can see the, in this mirror everything about our character. All the inward working of the character will be made manifest. The Lord would have you examine your own lives and see how vain is human glory. And this is the basic message that has been presented as uh, Dwight has gone through and presented these studies, these uh, not just the books themselves, but also what Ellen White has said about these different minor prophets. That we are being called to examine our own hearts, not the actions of those around us. That's not going to produce in us righteousness. It's not going to allow us to finish the work by condemning others. Because anyone can see the faults in another person. That's easy. But to recognize the faults in your own life and correct them, that's the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. And that's, that's something that's gained by cooperation with God through diligent effort. It's not going to come about casually by happenstance. It has to be by an effort. So the Lord wants us to examine our own lives to see how vain is human glory, human character. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. The period of our probation is fast closing. Soon, our opportunity to give the last message of mercy to the lost will be forever past. The help of everyone that loves Jesus is needed now in the Lord's work. There will let there be no idlers in the master's vineyard. Let there be no robbery of God in tithes and offerings, which are needed to sustain the cause. Now, of course, this is a problem uh, with this movement presently. <clears throat> in the past, I mean, as Seventh-day Adventists, we would give our tithes to the church. And I'm not one to tell people what to do with their tithes and their offerings, because that's something that is between you and God. But some have chosen to give, to continue to give tithes and offerings to the church. Some people, for a while, we would give tithes to FFA. Um, Jeff had urged people to give tithes and offerings within their own countries to support the work locally. Um, but we, somebody had asked a question before this study uh, regarding um, all of these dish, different factions, like where is the work? Who is, what groups are legitimate? And we are now in a situation where we have this individual uh, work to do and none of us want to rob God of tithes and offerings. And yet to where, where we're going to give those tithes and offerings and how we're going to use them I mean, obviously, we don't just use them for ourselves. But it, it's not clear cut what to do in that situation. Okay. So um, now there's a, a question in the chat. And I don't know if it takes us off the topic. Um, so the question is, how do you know that you are being worked upon by the Holy Spirit? Now, basically, we see in our own lives that we stumble and fall, right? Now, the problem here is we know what is the work of the Holy Spirit, according to Christ. He's going to send another comforter. He's going to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, 
because they believe not on me, on righteousness, because I go to the Father, and on judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And this is the work, the steps of salvation, justification, sanctification, and glorification, the work of judgment. And so if we are to look at ourselves, are we to see ourselves as righteous? Even if, even if we're perfecting Christian character, as Ellen White says, he that is seeking to perfect Christian character will never indulge the thought that he is sinless. Even if his life is irreproachable and he's a living representative of the truth that he professes, yet he will see in his life no good thing. So if you're seeing yourself as a sinner, you know that the Holy Spirit is working upon you. If you reject that work and neglect that work, if you push aside the Holy Spirit, that conviction, that voice of the Holy Spirit will lessen over time. The conviction won't be so strong. Now, we have all fallen in our lives, in our Christian experiences. Many times we've had to come and weep at the feet of Christ. But that is to be our daily experience, just how we came to Christ when we first came to him. Take our eyes off of ourselves. If we're looking at ourselves for righteousness, we're looking in the wrong place. We look to Christ for righteousness. And those that are doing that aren't going to be looking at their lives to, to look for righteousness, to see, am I now sinless? They will constantly be looking for a deeper experience. So this definitely relates to our topic. <clears throat> so as she says, the period of our probation is fast to close, is fast closing. We have this opportunity to give this message. We are not to be idle. We are not to rob God of tithes and offerings. And yet we're in this situation where we have this conviction. But we don't know where our energies are to be placed. How are we to do this work when this movement is fractured, when God's church is in apostasy? And yet God asks us to act. First, we have to study. And then we need to share those things that we study with others. We need to do the work that's put before us. And all I can say is that God will show people where to put their tithes and their offerings. Those who are laborers in word and doctrine will have all that they can possibly do in improving their God-given charge. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The minister's wife may be a great help to her husband in seeking to lighten his burden if she keeps her own soul in the love of God. She can teach the word to her children. She can manage her own household with economy and discretion. United with her husband, she can educate her children in habits of economy, teaching them to restrict their wants. Those who have large families will have burdens in the home life. Those who have but one or two children to engage their time and attention may educate themselves to do service for the Lord in helping their husbands in more general work. The liberal deviseth liberal things, and by liberal things shall he stand. There is that that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. The promise to those who honor God with their substance still stands upon record on the sacred page. If the Lord's people had faithfully obeyed his directions, the promise would have been fulfilled to them. But when men disregard the claims of God plainly set before them, the Lord permits them to follow their own way and reap the fruit of their doings, 
Whoever appropriates to his own use the portion that God has reserved is proving himself an unfaithful steward. He will lose not only that which he has withheld from God, but also that which was committed to him as his own. Let all study with special care the third chapter of Malachi. That chapter contains warning and instruction in righteousness for every soul. The Lord is still testing us to see whether we will prove faithful servants. He is calling upon his people to consider his goodness, to respond to his mercy, and to give proof of their loyalty by bringing all the tithes into his storehouse. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So this has been the topic of study. Uh, we began, I believe, on October 24th, 2021. So you're looking at more than a year and a half um, of study of the minor prophets. And she's talking here about the third chapter of Malachi. So let's take a look at this. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the whole Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. So in this study of Malachi, the third chapter, to understand what this is about, where would we generally... Uh, place Malachi chapter 3, just in, in a general sense. Where do we place this? Okay, so Samuel says at the time of the end. Okay, so uh, we do place it in, in a line. I don't know if we place it at the time of the end, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm not talking about on our lines, right? So we, we know that in Malachi, it's going to talk about Elijah who's going to come. He's going to precede uh, the Messiah, right? Um, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, right? And, and we would say that this Elijah would refer to John the Baptist, right? That would be the, the first application you would have. Christ makes that application, right? Not that he is personally Elijah, but he is fulfilling that role. He's preceding Christ. Um, so this messenger... I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That would be Elijah, right? Is that how we would understand it? So, so we could say this is at the time of the end, that, that the messenger comes, right? So we're in the time of Christ, we would put John the Baptist uh, at the time of the end, right? So that's, so we would do it that way. But in general, what people do is they put this, the question I was asking is where do we put this? We put this at the first coming of Christ, right? Right, Elijah comes before Christ comes. So that's, that's the application. But we know that this prophecy has other applications. Because we can put this into Millerite history. So we could say that the second ap application, as Samuel says, would be William Miller. Now, we often talk about the Elijah message. In some ways, we can mark Ellen White as Elijah. We could also mark Jeff as Elijah. Right. And, and this was done in 2018, where we had... Jeff was Elijah, and then he was going to pass on his robe, his cloak, to 
to Parminder as Elisha, right? Now, Jeff later recognized that he didn't have um, the authority to do that, that he had misread the lines, that he, that he had been misled in his understanding of the lines. Um, but still, the application uh, is correct in the sense that Jeff is this first messenger, just like Miller was, just like John the Baptist was. And then that there's a second message. Now, we're not looking for, in this movement, a Elisha. That was a mistake. That is, what we look at in this, in this movement, what we understand is we don't look at people to fulfill that role. Even Jeff, in fulfilling that role of, of the Elijah message, himself personally, um, after 9-11, He's fulfilling a role as part of the, the message of Samuel Snow. Right. So this movement represents Samuel Snow. And Jeff becomes one of the movement, obviously, as a leader, as, as the one who has given us these truths that God is using. He still had that position. But prophetically in the line, we don't just say that, that Jeff is Elijah all the way down that line because this movement is a little bit bigger than individuals. So Jeff just happened to be the leader of that first message. And in our study of understanding the lines, we, we've been able to understand that a little more clearly in our morning studies. <clears throat> So the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, right? That's Christ. And Christ is going to come to that temple, right? It's the glory of that temple is going to be greater than the former because Christ in humanity is going to enter that temple, which we call the second temple or sometimes Herod's temple. And, and give it glory. Even though it's not as glorious as Solomon's temple in structure, in building. It's going to have the presence of divinity combined in humanity. Entering that temple. But now it says, who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And in, in verse 5, it says, I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be swift a swift witness against the sorcerers and the adulterers and the swearers and those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless. And that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, said the Lord of hosts. Well, this is referring to the end of time. So Malachi 3 has an application to the time of Christ, but it moves to the judgment. October 22, 1844. To the investigative judgment, that's where he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. And then it goes to the exit, um, executive judgment at the end of the world, right? So all of these things are encompassed in this prophecy of Malachi. So that group of people that Ellen White sees in this dream, made up mostly of ministers and their families, that is studying the third chapter of Malachi, is receiving this strong conviction. Christ is going to be revealed to them in this dream. And they're going to see their deficiencies of character. This strong conviction comes upon them. And this is the work that is being done by this movement, by the truths that God has revealed to this movement. And if that work isn't done in us, we will have nothing to do with this work. Doesn't matter whether we who we associate with 
or what group we decide to associate with or what people individually we have to do this work no one can do it for you so malachi 3 goes on starting in verse 6 for i am the lord i change not therefore ye sons of jacob are not consumed even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. For ye shall be a delightsome land, said the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout witness against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is that? that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. So we can see here, I mean, the focus here is on tithes and offerings, God's storehouse. Many of us have faithfully paid our tithe to the Seventh-day Adventist Church for years and, and then uh, supported uh, the work of the present truth movement through our tithes and offerings. And this is much more than that. Because we can sometimes justify that because we've paid our tithes and offerings, doesn't the... The Pharisees say, I paid tithes of all that I possess. I fast twice in the week. But God is calling for much more. He's calling for all of us, for everything that we have. Not to just give all, everything we have because we have to live. But everything that we live, our whole life, the purpose of it is to minister to others, to present the truth. again, I'm not making this a study about where to pay tithes and offerings because that's something that you have to decide. But it's more than just the pain of tithes and offerings. Is our life committed completely to God and this work? Um, yeah. So yeah, we need to be controlled by God. We need to be, as uh, Samuel says, to be governed by him. Everything that we do is to be the Lord's work. Even if it's our regular job, it needs to be done to God's glory. And we cannot, we can't just consider, well, 10% is God's and 90% is mine. I can do with it as I please. Or, you know, I could say, well, I'm going to give 20% and 80% is mine. I can do with it as I please. If what we are doing with what God has given us is to please ourselves. If it's used in a worldly sense to adorn ourselves, to, to make ourselves comfortable while at the neglect of those around us, then we're not doing the Lord's work. We're still robbing him. That's true. God will bless us if we support the work. But that blessing is not to be squandered. It's still to be used to bless others. Yeah. 
So when we look at chapter four of Malachi, and this is a continuation of chapter three, but he's now going to talk about the destruction of the wicked. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all that all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. The day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, but it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth grow up, and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. That's where we get these, these final verses of Malachi. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel, the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dead, dreadful day of the Lord. So we have a messenger that comes before him. This is Elijah. And what is the Elijah message? It's repent and be converted, right? Right. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, I've always wondered about this, uh, this verse, this last verse. Um. So what does it mean, turn the heart of the fathers to the children? Who are the fathers? Who are the children? I mean, obviously, we could, we could apply this to our families, but I think this is bit broader than that. Okay, so Samuel says our pioneers, right? That is, we need to recognize that the messages of the past are given for our comfort, for our instruction, right? Fathers are to instruct their children. And children are to be instructed by their fathers. This is a return to the old past. This is what we have been called to do, to read the pioneer writings, to understand the experiences of the past. As a father in teaching my children, one of the things I do is share my experiences, my mistakes, my failures, and how God has delivered me from those experiences from my mistakes. But the child himself has to have their heart turned towards their fathers. They, we need to be instructed. We need to read and study the pioneers, learn from their experiences. Now, what this movement has done, so... Um, we have a little bit of time left. I'm going to go here to some of my slides. And I'm going to go here to Haggai. Let's see if I can find Haggai there. Okay, so I just want to look at a little bit about what, what it means to study this history. So this is a diagram that uh, addresses the books of Haggai and Zechariah. So I'm just trying to get more of it on the screen. Not everybody will be able to see this completely. But um, we have the reign of Darius. So Darius's reign begins September 29th. Uh, 522 BC, which is going to be uh, in 522 BC. If we look at uh, uh, 
the calendar, September 29th. That is going to be on the, <clears throat> the Babylonian calendar. That date that they give there, September 29, 522 BC, is the 10th day of the seventh month. So it's going to be on the Day of Atonement, right? <clears throat> on, on the Babylonian calendar. And then you're going to have, uh, I'm not sure why that is. I'm not sure why it doesn't say Haggai there, but I'm going to put that in there. Okay, so uh, you're going to see that Haggai is going to start uh, prophesying. Um, it says in Haggai 1.1. 1, 1, In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel uh, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, what they're going to be doing in Haggai is... They're going to be taking this money that should be applied to building this temple, and they're going to be um, using it on their own houses, right? So in Haggai chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her food, fruit. So you can see this is the same situation that we have in Malachi. God's house, God's work is not being accomplished because we're just focused upon our own things, our own comfort. And God is calling us to do a work. Now, of course, to do that, that work, we need to be united with Christ. And if we're united with Christ, we'll be united with one another. <clears throat> um, so going back to this diagram here, we're going to see that Haggai's going to prophesy, and during that time that he prophesies, he's urging them to go and begin rebuilding the temple. Now, some people assume that uh, Darius's decree, because we're going to find that Darius is going to give a decree to finish the temple, and they assume that this decree starts the building of the temple. But what's going to happen in the Bible is first they're going to commence, because of the prophesy of Haggai and Zechariah, they're going to commence this construction of the temple. So the construction of the temple isn't happening in 520. This is just the prophesy, right? Now they might have started in 519, maybe 518. We don't know when they commenced 
recommence the construction of the temple. But it's going to be under the prophesying of Zechariah, Zechariah and Haggai. And we can see that Zechariah is going to be prophesying um, uh, all the way to 518. And, and yet Darius' decree, because Cyrus's decree occurs in 536 in the spring, in April, um, Darius's decree is going to be more than 20 years after Cyrus's decree. And Ellen White says that they're going to return under Cyrus's decree to Jerusalem, and they're going to, on the first day of the seventh month, they're going to set up an altar. And, and she says that it's less than 20 years from when they return to Jerusalem under Cyrus's decree to when Darius's decree occurs. So if Alan White is correct, which I believe she is, because I'd figured this out before I read it in the Spirit of Prophecy, that Darius's decree occurs in 516. After they had already been working on the temple for, for a time, Darius finally examines this because of the complaints of the enemies. Uh, they're going to do an examination of the records, and they're going to find the original decree of Cyrus. And Darius then is going to issue his own decree, which allows them to continue the work on the temple, which will be finished in the spring of 515 BC. Now, I say this because... Ellen White says that we're going to take the study of these books, Haggai, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Daniel, in connection with the book of he Malachi, and we're going to lay events on a line. There's a delineation, right, is the word she uses, which means to set upon a line. And from the study of these things, from the Jewish economy, which include not just the sanctuary services, but the feasts, the types, all of the symbols that point to Christ, all of these things are going to come to bear upon bringing a conviction to God's people in the last days. And that conviction will reveal to us our sins, our need of Christ. If we have a study of the scriptures that does not bring upon us a conviction of our sins, does not show us that we are sinners, that makes us compare ourselves with others and think of ourselves as better than others, that study of the scriptures is not in accordance with the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit is not giving us that light. Now, there may be light there. People can teach truth without the Holy Spirit. People can stumble upon, maybe by accident, things that are true and present those things. They may hear other people presenting truths and present those truths. But if they're not put into this proper context, this line upon line that reveals to us our sins, it's a misapplication of the scriptures, even if it contains truth. This is what we are facing in this movement at the present time. I mean, this is why we call the camp meeting this summer. Because we believe that we are to come to the upper room. We need to come together. First, individually go to God and recognize our sins. And then come together and confess our sins. To recognize our failures as a movement. This is the most solemn work, the work, work of self-examination, of self-examination that leads us to unite our efforts with others. There's much study of the scriptures that is meant only to exalt self, to show that we're better than others because we know certain things or we understand some things correctly or other people are making errors. And we think because we can point out their errors, that that somehow justifies us or makes us better than others. The fact that we have truth and light 
should show us the conviction, give us the conviction that we are far from God. And if we just have the belief that we are better than others, we are under a great deception. We are no better than anyone else. Just because we are given light and believe the truth, profess to believe the truth, that doesn't make us saved. It doesn't make us righteous. So this is the problem that we all face. I don't know if I have anything more to say right now. We're, we've got about 10 minutes left. Does anybody want to comment on what we've talked about? Do we see what this movement is facing at the present time and why we've been led to this study? I'll just finish off a little bit from Zechariah. Um, now, in the book of Zechariah, um, Zechariah is going to be talking about the temple, of course, it's it needing to be rebuilt. And he's going to um, begin his prophesying in the eighth month in the second year of Darius. Uh, just before Haggai's last uh, vision. And it says in um, Zechariah 1, verse 7, in the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sebat, uh, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of the Ido, the prophet. Right? And he's going to have this vision dealing with these horses. Right? We, we talked about this last week. This is where we were studying last week. And um, uh, this, um, this month, Sebat, it's the 11th month, right, as it says, um, and the 24th day of that month, that he's going to have this, this vision, right, of these horses. And in this vision, which is what I pointed out, that the angel is going to uh, make this comment in verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? Now, these, this period of 70 years is not the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. This is the 70 years from when the temple had been destroyed to when it is going to be rebuilt. Now, this is a couple of years. Well, it's basically it's four years uh, before the temple is going to be completed. So why does the angel not say these 66 years? Because it's going to be 70 years, but at this point, it's only 66. And the answer to that question would simply be that the angel is recognizing that this is a period of 70 years that God is going to have indignation. So God has had indignation. At this point, we're only 66 years into this indignation. We're not 70 years into it. <clears throat> so this is a time prophecy. 70 years of the temple that it lay in ruins now it's going to be rebuilt so he's basically telling him um telling zechariah the angel is um that there's still going to be four more years so the question in, in a sense is a rhetorical question 
How long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? Well, it's going to be 70 years. It's a time prophecy. It's not stating about a period of 70 years that have happened. It's talking about a period of 70 years that's going to end four years from now. Right. In that time. And in, in the fourth year of King Darius, so this is going to be, because it's going to be in the sixth year that the temple is going to be dedicated. So here in the fourth year of, of Darius, in uh, the fourth day of the ninth month, um, that the same statement is going to be made, a little bit different. But the question is, you know, starting in verse uh, four, then the word of the Lord came, uh, Lord of hosts, then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? Well, at this point, it's actually been 68 years since the fast of the events that the fast of the fifth and the seventh month occurred. So that is, the temple was destroyed in the fifth month in 586. And in the seventh month, Gedaliah, who was placed as governor, is going to be murdered. And they did these commemorative fasts. So that means the next year, in 585, on the fifth month, and then on the seventh month, they're going to fast or mourn the destruction of the temple and then the death of Gedaliah. And they do those, that's going to happen during this period of 70 years. Right? So it's referring to that same period of time. This is the same period of 70 years in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. So when we look at these lines... It's telling us something that is important for us to understand in this movement, that there is a, another period of 70 years that isn't just the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. This is the 70 years of the temple. So you can see here, this vision in Zechariah chapter 7 is given in uh, uh, the ninth month and the fourth day of the month in the fourth year of Darius. That's going to be... Um, December 7th, uh, 518 BC. And that's going to be more than two years before the temple is, is completed. And it's going to be about a year and a half before Darius's decree. Right? So the 70 years of when the temple was destroyed would technically be um, around the time of Darius's decree. So he's going to make a decree 70 years after the temple is destroyed. We don't know the exact date of his decree, but it's going to be in his sixth year. So about 70 years, 70 years to the year of when the temple is destroyed. And the temple is going to be completed about uh, seven months after that. Okay, so... Okay, so uh, Aran just noted that 9 times 4 times 4 equals 144. That symbol of the 144,000. So that's just a note regarding that date. And we found all kinds of symbols in these dates and these spans of time in Ezekiel and uh, Zechariah and Darius and of uh, Haggai dealing with Darius's decree. But these are, are periods of 70 years that are being marked, all of these symbols. So the point that we have here to make is that there's lots to learn. But in studying these things, what's the purpose? It's definitely not to exalt self, to make ourselves appear better than others. It's not to make predictions so that we can be vindicated. The reason that God has given us this information 
through the study of the scriptures is to bring a conviction in our own lives for us to see that we are indeed sinners, that God sits enthroned and rules over all the events of the play and counterplay of human history, that he governs our lives, that he has purposely placed us where we are presently, that the trials that we face are meant for us to gain a faith and trust in God, to face what is coming upon the earth, And if we trust in God, he will deliver us. And we need to experience that. And we are to look to God and not to man. So I hope this study has been a blessing to all who've uh, participated or watched this study. Um, but we're now uh, going to close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we need your presence in our lives. We know that we have studied your word and you have revealed light to us. We ask that you can give us strength to walk in that light. Help us to take up our cross and to follow Christ. Forgive us for our sins our lack of devotion and commitment to the truth. We ask, Lord, that you can use us in spite of ourselves, that we can redeem the time in taking up the work now at so late an hour. I pray that you can speak to each heart, that the conviction of your spirit will unite this work. And I pray, Lord, that we can do all that, that we can in our power to encourage and strengthen those around us and to give the gospel to all who will hear. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Bless this Sabbath and the time that we have with you and with each other. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.